Hello again, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's event on the China-Russia Nexus of Disinformation. My name is David Salvo. I'm the Managing Director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. I'm joined here by my colleague, Brett Schaefer, also of the Alliance for Securing Democracy, and uh, representatives of Radio Free Asia and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. We're really thrilled to have such uh, terrific expertise on today's panel to discuss a really timely topic. I think we've long associated disinformation and information manipulation writ large with the government of the Russian Federation, but certainly the People's Republic of China has caught up. We now see state actors and state-sponsored media from both countries waging information operations around the globe to advance our interests and to undermine the interests of the United States and our allies and partners. Our discussion today will focus on whether there really is indeed a nexus between these two governments uh, in their information campaigns, what methods the regimes do use to wage information operations around the world, and where specifically do they hone these tactics? We'll also discuss these issues in the context of an all-important election year here in 2024. Uh, as many of you know, Taiwan recently held elections. This is a great framing to discuss the PRC's information manipulation tactics. We've recently commemorated the two-year, uh, com we've recently commemorating the two-year mark of the full-scale, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And that, of course, is uh, a necessary framing to discuss Russia's information operations around the globe. Um, and there are many other elections on the horizon. I don't need to delineate which ones. I think we all know which that both uh, nation states will have their eye on in terms of uh, conducting information operations, again, around the globe. We have a great panel to tackle, to tackle these questions. Uh, RFA and RFERL are covering these issues every day in the field. Uh, here at GMF, ASD is tracking state-sponsored narratives around the globe through our Hamilton 2.0 dashboard. So there's a lot of, a lot of ground to cover. I will quickly go over the ground rules, introduce our speakers, and we'll just dive into the conversation. So quickly, ground rules. This is an on-the-record conversation, which is good since we are working with journalists here, so they know this all too well. It is open to media and attribution. And audience members, please feel free to ask questions using the chat function in uh, in Zoom. Q&A, Q&A function, sorry, not the chat function, the Q&A function, uh, important delineation, thank you. Um, and we will get to as many as we can. We will definitely leave time for audience Q&A. So our panelists, Min Mitchell, who's the executive editor of Radio Free Asia. She oversees company-wide editorial operations. She's been instrumental in developing RFA's comprehensive editorial strategy to match the fast evolving needs of audiences in Asia and globally as well as addressing the challenges posed by the global rise of authoritarianism and disinformation, which of course go hand in hand. She's led the development of RFA's Asia, RFA's Asia Fact Check Lab, which debunks falsehood and tracks the spread of malign influence and propaganda seated in misleading narratives, such as a recent surge in China-Russia coordinated misinformation on the war in Ukraine and Chinese interference in the 2024 Taiwan presidential election, two issues we will certainly cover today. Brett Schaefer is the Senior Fellow for Media and Digital Disinformation here at German Marshall Fund at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. He heads our information manipulation team. He's the creator and manager of the aforementioned Hamilton 2.0 dashboard, which is an online open source dashboard tracking the outputs of Russian, Chinese, and Iranian state media outlets, diplomats, and government officials across numerous media platforms. He's an expert in computational propaganda, state-backed information operations, and tech regulation and he's spoken at conferences around the globe and advised numerous governments and NGOs on these very issues. And finally, we have Reed Standish. He's uh, the correspondent for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, based in Prague, and the author of the China in Eurasia Briefing. He focuses on Chinese foreign policy in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and has reported extensively about China's Belt and Road Initiative and Beijing's internment camps in Xinjiang. Prior to joining RFERL, Reed was also an editor at Foreign Policy Magazine and its Moscow correspondent. He's also written for The Atlantic and The Washington Post. So with that, let's dive in. We should start with sort of the all important question because it's been covered, but I don't know if anyone really has sort of the magic answer to the question, is there actually a nexus of Russian and PRC information operations? Is there a true convergence in the tactics and methods that these 
um, that these two governments use? And if so, what are they? And if not, where do they diverge? So Min, why don't I start with you to maybe set the scene and then Reed and Brent can, can chime in as well. Wonderful. Thank you, David, for hosting this timely discussion. It's a pleasure and honor to be on this great panel with people I admire greatly. And I also want to thank you for inviting me and congratulations for your outstanding work through the Alliance for Securing Dem Democracy Project. So let me um, offer my observations on Russian and specifically Chinese information manipulation tactics and how they diverge first. So as you all know better than I, uh, Russian information manipulation traditionally has focused on amplifying rumors to sow seeds of distrust in the West and in countries that lean to the West. That means undermining NATO, the EU, Ukraine, Poland, uh, Baltic countries, and of course, the United States, among many other countries. They have become very adept uh, at using local journalists, media, and social media accounts to make uh, disinformation seem organic. And on the other side, the Chinese Communist Party's information manipulation has traditionally been aimed at its own population. But over the past decade, the CCP has focused more and more on reaching Chinese-speaking populations overseas. Their main purpose is has been to burnish the record of CCP, uh, uh, denigrate the United States, and convey how Western democracy is deficient and not appropriate for the Chinese people. Most recently, however, China has begun deploying Russian-style disinformation tactics. There are a few uh, examples. During the COVID pandemic, for instance, Beijing amplified bogus stories seeking to deflect attention to itself over the pandemic's origin by pushing the narrative that the United States military may have been the source of COVID, as you all know. And I should also add, when CCP covered up its underreported fatalities and mishandling of its response in Wuhan early on, Radio Free Asia among, is among the first to report fatalities being much, much higher. And Taiwan, as we just talked about, of course, has been the leading target of CCP disinformation providing a window into their evolving methods. According to the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, for 10 years straight, Taiwan has been the country most impacted by foreign disinformation. And RFA through its Asia Fact Check Lab, which we established in 2022, closely covered how the CCP has distorted news and spread falsehoods about Taiwan, efforts which intensified in advance of Taiwan's national election in January 2024. This included campaigns by state-backed media, as well as rumor recycled uh, on Chinese social media. So the CCP is fully aware of the vulnerabilities in Taiwan's media space and has become quite adept at striking its weak points. In the process, it has gained considerable experience in disinformation campaigns. And as, re as reported by our fact check lab, CCP disseminated messages, for instance, sought to promote themes like doubt about the US commitment to Taiwan's security, one campaign pushed the narrative that the U.S. sees Taiwan as merely a bargaining chip and will abandon it eventually. And another sub-narrative was that the U.S. plans to destroy Taiwan's semiconductor giant TSMC to hurt China. And another message tried to uh, is try to increase anxiety about inevitable inv invasion and conflict. This includes uh, inciting fear in ordinary Taiwanese that China military, Chinese military will attack the island if the wrong candidate wins. And another message sought to convince Taiwanese that the US and the West engage in election interference. And this includes narratives that the US is backing specific candidates and parties. And our Asia Fact Check Lab found CCP 
uh, was actually connected to a fake election pool in order to favor uh, their interest. And this report got cited by Taiwan's foreign minister just days before the election. And speaking of where uh, Russia and China, uh, uh, their tactics converge, I have uh, an example. Uh, as you know, Russia has pushed the story about uh, uh, bioweapon lab that U.S. was helping uh, Ukraine uh, to build uh, during uh, the, the, their invasion. And guess what? Uh, there is a crazy story we fact-checked that involves the same narrative that uh, U.S. and the Taiwanese official secretly met in South China Sea in 2022 to discuss creating a bioweapon lab. It was all over Chinese state media and social platform. And it even reached my own parents' line group. It's a communication app like WhatsApp in Taiwan. I'm originally from Taiwan and my parents still live there. So my parents, 80 year old parents shared the story in their group chat and they got into this heated argument about whether the US is inciting a war between Taiwan and China. And my parents sent it to me. I returned the text with our fact check story. My mom wrote back, is your story true? Uh, so my mom demonstrates that while Taiwan has steadily uh, enhanced its uh, resilience against CCP's information manipulation, Chinese influence operations are becoming more and more skillful and more and more like Russia in its tactics. With that, I will uh, give it back to David and maybe uh, my colleague Reed can elaborate on this. Thanks, man. Yeah, Reed, and Brett, maybe if you have two fingers on that to sort of flesh out some of those comments. Sure, sure. Pleasure to. Um, well, thank you guys all for, for having me here. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, the the name of this, you know, we're talking about collaboration, which maybe that is kind of the right word here. Um, you know, there there's growing cooperation happening between the Russians and the Chinese, but I think it's still really unclear if you can say any of this is coordinated in any way. Um, I think by most accounts, it's not rather, you know, there's a lot of watching, copying and learning. And I think the thing we're seeing is a lot more of sort of formalized ways of learning and sharing tactics. tactics and that's a lot of what's going on, you know, talking about Ukraine, um, you know, Min brought up the example about the bioweapons, or sorry, the biolabs, which is a thing that's been cycled around in, in Russia for forever. But I think also around uh, the war in Ukraine, I mean, there was a lot of these these really Russian uh, Russian state media disinformation tactics that have been around for a long time that really started popping up um, on the Chinese networks through Chinese platforms. Um, you know, there's things about uh, covering over the, the Buka uh, massacre that happened in Ukraine, you know, saying that that was a hoax. You know, there's a lot of stuff about George Soros conspiracy theories and things like that popping up in a lot of cases sort of almost word for word for how they appear in in the Russian press. Um, but I think more what's been a little bit interesting around Ukraine, especially when you look at how the Chinese have tackled it, um, you know, there's a lot of that is geared around discrediting the United States. It's about, you know, showing that there's holes in Western resolve that, you know, this war is the fault of NATO and, and especially around especially in the early, the first year, and maybe a little bit after that, there was a really strong narrative there about, you know, giving cover for Russia, its own narrative, and its justifications for invasion, invading in the first place. And I think obviously, we know Chinese media, uh, Chinese officials, they've never called it actually an invasion since day one and kind of go to great lengths to avoid all of that. So, um, you know, I think zooming back a little bit from that and like where we are in this moment, you know, we want to talk about Russia and China, what kind of cooperation exists there. You know, I think it's important to note, you know, this is in some ways, the fact that we're talking about this now is this culmination of like a decade of newfound agreements that have been happening between China and Russia, essentially since she came to power. Actually, the very first meeting that Putin and she had together as official heads of state, they did sign a big agreement on information cooperation, sharing, you know, fighting us, you know, basically about keeping Western information out of Russia and China. Um, and that's really expanded quite a lot. And I think that's, you know, when we're talking about the war, right, there's 
we're talking about collaborating on these narratives. But really, I think the a big point of what's happening at the war while they're doing stuff abroad, it's really about the coordination and the learning that is happening that's getting applied back at home for their domestic audiences and what they're feeding them. Um, so, you know, a few years ago, there was some uh, hack documents that came out that talked about a deal between Russia and Chinese uh, state-led outlets, basically about, you know, sharing content, best practices, organizing exchanges, and co-producing a bunch of different shows. Um, and I also say that at Radio for Europe last year, uh, we also got this big trove of hack documents that showed all these various meetings that had happened from 2017 to 2019 between Roskomnadzor, which is the government agency that's charged with policing Russia's internet, and then the Cyberspace Administration of China. And those files really gave us this interesting behind the scenes look into what was happening at a very practical level. Um, and a lot of that, you know, we see these kind of, to be honest, li having listened to a lot of those recordings, quite boring conversations, you know, very boardrooms, translators, all of those kind of things. But it is really, a, it's a focus on learning best practices. And it's really interesting because, you know, you can really see what the other one thinks that the other one is doing better than them and how they can learn from that and how they can apply that to suit their own needs. And it also shows us a lot of like what they're concerned about, what they're focused on, which there's some divergence that's happening there. So, you know, for instance, the Russian officials, they're asking the Chinese for guidance on how to disrupt VPNs, how to deal with Tor, how to better attack and crack encrypted internet traffic and messaging platforms. Um, and the Russians also wanted to arrange a visit to China to send specialists there to study how the Great Firewall worked in better detail. So about, you know, really censoring and controlling the flows of information at home in that really technical aspect. The Russians were really trying to, to zero in on that from the Chinese. Um, and then the Chinese priorities, I think, are also pretty illuminating, you know, especially if we think about what Min was saying about China really looking, you know, cares a lot about its image, um, you know, trying to portray itself as this leader of the global south in a lot of ways. Um, so they were looking at, you know, the ways that Russia can control information online to curb protests. They were also looking at how what they called, you know, Russia's image making abroad. They really were quite curious about that and asking to learn more on that. And then also some very you know, interesting asking to, you know, block uh, content inside Russia about Xinjiang, Uyghurs. Curiously, this very old 60 Minutes interview with Zhang Zemin, I think it's because he talks about the Tiananmen Square uh, protests there. Um, so it really kind of shows us what's happening. You know, it's not just abroad what we're talking about. It's, it's there's, there's this two-way flow. And a lot of what's getting, I think, learned and applied at home is also getting... Uh, sent out and used abroad as there's that that learning. And so maybe I'll leave it there and turn it back to you guys, but I think there's also still a lot more to to dig in there. Thanks, there's, there's lots of to comments on there. There's also one thread I would love if you could pull since you're studying sort of the overt space. Mm -hmm. I like how Reed sort of framed what's happening maybe behind the scenes in the, in the gray uh, disinformation world. But there's something that Min mentioned where she said that the PRC focuses a lot on its diaspora overseas, but they've also, as Reed just said, asked Russia for help with its image making tactics, uh, which suggests maybe an evolution in its target audience. And I'm wondering if you see anything um, that suggests that the PRC is increasingly focused on, say, foreign speaking audiences as opposed to Mandarin speaking diaspora groups overseas, or whether that's still really like part and parcel of what they're trying to accomplish. Well, I mean, one of the interesting things that we've looked at since we started studying both countries around 2019, 2020, is the Kremlin used to be very different from what we saw from China and that the Kremlin really didn't talk about Russia with its external messaging. So when we did an analysis of every YouTube video published on RT America over a course of a year or two, something like 4% of those videos even mentioned Russia. And when we did the same thing with CGTN, it was roughly 25%. So China really was still attempting to present this positive image of China to the world, where Russia, frankly, didn't really care. It wasn't about attracting audiences to Russia. It was about repelling them from their adversaries. We've seen China shift in the Russian direction for the last couple of years, but I'd say in the last year or so, they've maybe shifted back in the other direction. 
So a lot of coverage uh, in the media is focused on China's wolf warrior diplomacy style. And we certainly saw it, it wasn't all of Chinese diplomats and it certainly wasn't all of their embassy accounts, but maybe 20 or 30 of their most vocal diplomats on Twitter adopted this very aggressive confrontational style and were sort of dubbed the wolf warriors. I think China has found that that's really not an effective strategy for building China's image globally. Yes, it was very good at attracting audiences on Twitter. I mean, those were the people who had huge followings. So when you talk about Zhao Li Jian, for example, who's China's, uh, I think he was the number two spokesperson in the Chinese MFA, he had something like a million followers and had attracted this huge sort of cult following on Twitter. But I don't think that was really helping China in terms of their public diplomacy and, and their efforts to uh, present China positively on the world stage. And now he's heading, I think, the Boundary and Ocean Department. So he's been sidelined. And we've seen others, sort of these fringy Chinese diplomats, like the Council General in Belfast, who used to, when we had Twitter access on Hamilton, almost every week, she was the number one account of all of the Chinese accounts we tracked on Twitter, or now X, uh, basically because she was confrontational, she was conspiratorial, and her rhetoric has totally shifted over the last six months. So I think the Wolf Warrior style has... Um, has been drawn back a little bit because I think the higher ups realize that ultimately it's not all that effective, especially in Europe. So I, I think China's fine being confrontational with the United States. If you're talking about the nexus between China and Russia, the glue there is anti-Americanism. If you look at their outlets globally, that's the one commonality. But I think the confrontational style directed at Europe I don't think they found that to be a winning approach. So we've seen them the pendulum has sort of swung back. To what we saw in 2019, 2020, where it's more about presenting China as a as a great partner on the world stage. Interesting. And in terms of in terms of the audience, uh, Reed and, and Min, are you noticing that there's maybe less of a focus of uh, targeting the diasporas overseas, or, or Min, especially since you know you you are looking at this every day, or you know as as Brett says, is there more of an image, more of an attempt to portray the PRC as like a you know constructive partner on the global stage? Because there's been a lot of media coverage about like Chinese interference, for example, in elections and targeting uh, ethnic Chinese diaspora groups. So I'm wondering sort of where this all fits together. Yeah, China is definitely uh, reaching out to its overseas population. And uh, uh, a lot of them, even outside China, they still live in their Weibo and uh, WeChat uh, bubbles. So that's a very powerful machine that uh, these disinformation still circulate uh, in the uh, overseas. And uh, uh, I, I think you know that this is uh, this is what they are uh, really like expanding uh, their disinformation campaign, uh, you know, globally. And uh, I also want to go back to a little bit on uh, Ukraine and Taiwan. Uh, so uh, uh, our fact check lab uh, worked with. Uh, Dictator Media, IRI, and DoubleThink, uh, DoubleThink Lab did a research report on Ukraine, uh, China, Russia, Ukraine, and there's a very uh, there there's some really interesting findings that I I would like to share. Like uh, one technique observed that uh, the indirect or direct uh, quoting of Russian officials or Russian media uh, in Mandarin uh, with very little identified divergence in Russian and Chinese narratives concerning the invasion of Ukraine. And the analysis indicates there are two over, uh, overarching themes observed in both languages. Uh, first, it's anti-American and anti-Western sentiment. And second, it's uh, positioning Russia as a victim or hero. So, you know, th these are, uh, these are all very interesting trends to see how they are uh, collaborating together. And RT is actually the only foreign media that's officially allowed uh, in China. I'll just stop here for a uh, read. Yeah, sure. I can build off that a, a bit. So, I mean, I, I, I think especially in, in my job, I see I'm looking much more at the you know, is a reaching other parts of the world rather than the Chinese or Mandarin speaking diasporas around there. Um, and I think, you know, if we take 
Ukraine, and if we can throw Gaza into there. I mean, I think that that maybe isn't even really disinformation, or it's partly disinformation, more propaganda, but it's, you know, given a lot of fodder to it. There's a lot of fuel for China to to cook with, a lot of ingredients to bring into the the propaganda disinformation kitchen. Um, and, um, you know, it is really this anti-US message, like quite transparently so. Um, and But that resonates in a lot of the world, right? And I think especially, you know, it is not a secret. I think China has been courting the global South for quite some time, um, you know, well before either of those conflicts. It's been investing in overseas media. You know, if you talk about Africa, I believe that Xinhua has the largest network of foreign correspondents there. Um, you know, there's been billions that have been put into there. It's also into the Middle East. We can even talk about some areas and across the former Soviet Union. You're starting to see uh, Chinese networks set up affiliates there as well. So there is this big expansion. And yeah, I think a lot of it is around partly boosting image making, partly, you know, boosting a bit of those you know, those big sensitive areas that China carries a lot, care, cares a lot about Taiwan, um, you know, especially if we're talking about in the Muslim world, things related to Xinjiang and the crackdown that happened against Uyghurs and other groups there. Um, and so I think that that is, you know, there's a big, there's a lot of ways to amplify that message through all of that. And I think that that is, it's honestly, I think, taking hold quite a ways, you know, maybe in, in Western, for Western audiences, not so much, maybe going actually in the opposite direction. But if you want to talk about Africa, the Middle East, I think that there's quite fertile terrain and um, I think it's it's taking off. Thanks, Ray. Brett, do you want to maybe explain what you're seeing in the Global South? I mean, obviously, this, what you mentioned, Middle East and Africa, Latin America has also been a big uh, battleground for competition with, with the United States, especially from a, a Russian perspective. What metrics are you seeing from both, you know, state-sponsored media outlets and, and government uh, officials in these regions? Yeah, I think we can be a little bit myopic looking at the transatlantic space and sort of gauging the success of Russia and China, just looking at the sort of reactions of publics in Europe and the United States. If you look at the numbers in Latin America in particular, they're pretty staggering when you look at the success of both China and Russia, particularly Russia in Latin America. I pulled numbers the other day of the last year uh, on Facebook. And if you look at the major Spanish language global media outlets, RT and Espanol is first in terms of followers, in terms of likes. CGTN and Espanol is second. CNN and Espanol is third. Univision is fourth. So they are outperforming these major independent uh, Spanish language outlets. Voz de America sits at about 11th of the outlets that we were looking at. And so their reach in, in the Spanish language markets is enormous. And I think when you talk to colleagues in Colombia and in South America and Central America, the sense is that they are not fringe outlets there. They are seen as sort of major global media players the way that you would look at the BBC here. Uh, and it's interesting there that particularly looking at Russia, the tone is quite different than what you see from RT in Europe and the United States. So in the US, uh, RT Deutsch, RT en Francais, they tend to be these sort of right-leaning outlets in Latin America. RT en Espanol is very much the sort of traditional anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist, kind of leftist uh, media outlet. And when you do network mapping and look at the communities that are engaging with that content, they tend to be sort of way left-leaning uh, political communities in all of the countries that we monitored in Latin America. We mentioned in Africa, CGTN in Africa does quite well as well. Uh, I think it is their, on YouTube, CGTN in Africa, I think is their, their second most followed uh, channel. So when we only look at the successes of the Kremlin uh, and in Beijing in Europe and the United States, we're really missing what's happening in a lot of the world, which I think is honestly more of their focus. Uh, there's less competition there in some cases. And there's more opportunity to give their content to uh, authentic, genuine domestic media outlets who are content starved. So Ruffley, for example, has been very good about getting uh, their Stringer content to outlets in the Global South who need Stringer footage from Ukraine. And so they've been able to get footage in the hands of domestic media outlets. So it's not just what they're doing through their overt channels. It's also what they're able to distribute through authentic local media outlets as well. 
that this might be a good place to pivot and take advantage of, of Min and Reed's positions as you know journalists and, and editors in the field who are covering these issues sort of on a on a global scale. Um, I'm curious, sort of well, two things I'm curious about. One is how do you ensure that your organizations are looking well beyond national borders um, to cover this phenomenon of, of PRC or, or Russian disinformation, you know, very far afield in Latin America or the Middle East or Africa. So that's one. I'm also curious what newsroom procedures you have in place to make sure that you are not sort of inadvertently amplifying or being the victim of uh, state-sponsored information operations. I mean, this is this isn't to pick on on you, but in the in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, you know, 30 plus of the of the major American news outlets were am inadvertently amplifying Russian disinformation accounts online. And this isn't to say that RFA or RFERL has done this, but I'm curious what you've sort of learned from that experience to ensure that you yourselves are not uh, targeted and 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 inadvertently amplifying um, this sort of these sorts of operations. Um, do you want to go, go first, Ben, or do you want me to hop in? No, we go first. That's okay. okay. Um, sure. I mean, I can. I, I'll go bite off what I what I could do there. Um, you know, in terms of, I mean, it's obviously it's a it's a massive problem. I mean, speaking anecdotally, I mean, you look at all the big surveys of every newsroom everywhere. I mean, I think this is the biggest thing that uh, people are identifying as problems for their newsrooms. And then I think you couple that. You know, zooming out a bit, I'll come back to talking specifically about our, um, what we do. But you know, you're talking about all the inroads that have been made in places like Africa, Latin America. You know, part of that is happening because a lot of the traditional gatekeepers, the big uh, outlets, are you know, there's they're going under. There's layoffs. There's less budgets. Um, you know, so in places like Africa, CGTN can come and you know just hire up all these correspondents who don't have a place to work anymore, and they'll happily take up the job. And so that's kind of created a lot of that hole. And I think that's that's part of the equation too of just the, the underfunding and the wider kind of business issues hitting newsrooms on a very practical level that's coming at the exact same time that you have, you know, deep fakes and AI taking over and doing all sorts of stuff that's gonna make that even more difficult. I mean, in terms of what we do, you know, we have, um, you know, public editor, we have a lot that's gone there that's, that's really focused on just trying to make sure that you know, all those, uh, all the, the T's are being crossed, crossed and the I's are being dotted. Um, and just trying to create in, you know, procedures, you know, when you're dealing with something that is sensitive, you know, you're getting extra eyes on it, you know, just creating all of those, you know, we call them fail safes. Um, but obviously that's easier said than done, especially, you know, when you're dealing with all the practical constraints of, all right, you know, is this a time sensitive scoop? We need to rush. We need to move forward. You know, like you're 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 running out of that wiggle room really to go through and be so thorough. It's a hard hard thing to do in the moment, I think, especially. Um, so I think it's a it's a focus then about making sure you have that editorial muscle behind the scenes, and then also um, I think making sure that there's a credibility and a respect. So knowing that okay, if you're seeing this coming from you know from us or from you know someone else, you, you want to know that. You have a relationship with your consumer and they're going to trust and respect what's coming out of your what they're seeing on your outlet yeah i will uh echo read on this i i think uh you know the big thing is uh for us for radio free asia and radio free europe uh the, the uniqueness is using this surrogate journalist uh journalism model so in most of the times uh we don't have reporters on the ground in these very difficult uh, media environments or or the societies period so uh we have to be even more uh uh in installing even more higher standards on our our journalism and this is why people trust uh, our reporting uh, we have reporters that have the language skills networks uh, knowledge of, of the place and this also plays into i think a bigger uh, topic about the public funded uh, broadcaster public funded media that we can uh, just 
focus on the quality of journalism and earn the trust uh, of the audience in a time that they are going to see all kinds of stuff on their social media uh, platforms. Um, and and on this end, uh, RFA has invested a lot uh, in reaching audience beyond Asia with more, content, with more uh, digital products. Uh, we have to meet where our audience are, where they are, uh, be it shortwave TV or cell phones. And uh, we have to be even more competitive in our content and be more creative in our uh, storytelling uh, skills to attract them. Because, you know, if you have two minutes on, on TikTok, on, on Facebook, would you rather watch a dancing singing video or a really sad Uyghur person being arrested and sentenced to death? So these are the challenges and the things that we've been do doing uh, day in and day out. And the other point I want to make is uh, going to Brett. I think uh, uh, how to help uh, local media having that mindset in building out uh, uh, content and media outlets is very important. Um, uh, in the global south, it's almost like a news desert. Uh, there, there isn't any local media. Uh, so I think there is a big gap uh, that we can feel. Uh, for example, uh, the U USAGM, uh, our agency, our mother agency, is now trying to create a new initiative called New Global News Service that would provide uh, credible, fact-based uh, content from all networks to uh, the third country's media outlets, uh, traditional ones, legacy ones, or uh, the uh, social media influencers, providing them uh, alternative content that they, they can use. And the other thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, like RFA, we created a few digital brands like uh, Why Now, Why Now? It's a digital magazine catered to younger uh, Chinese audience. And the, 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 Thinking the logic behind it is to appeal to younger Mandarin speaking audience and building this engaged community with a more niche content. And that has been proven a uh, success. We saw Mendoza on Russia, we saw Rappler uh, in Philippines, and we're in a different uh, uh, you know, media landscape information age that we have to be more creative on how we can increase our impact and reach. Thanks, but there's there's a lot to unpack here. Again, I know you've done a lot of work looking at sort of U.S. public diplomacy and what both the State Department and USAGM can do to to address the very issues that Minis just talked about. Do you have a sense that? with the rapidly evolving information space, even though the United States has been thoroughly outcompeted in many parts of the world by the, the Chinese and Russian state media apparatuses, that there is still an ability with the right resources and the right, you know, new ways, innovative ways of, of, of reaching audiences that we can get, get some of these audiences back? Sure. I mean, well... <laughs> I'll back up to one of the truisms is it doesn't matter how good your message is if your policies are unpopular. So we can spend, I mean, however much money we can throw at the issue if ultimately the U.S. is seen as a uh, not particularly good partner to other parts of the world. It's not really going to matter how good USAGM is able to function in those regions. That being said, I haven't looked at the fiscal year budget this year, but when we did reporting on this the last couple of years, the Spanish language budget for Voice of America, Voz de America, was like in the $10 million range. I mean, that that's not a lot when you look at the US government budget. And so certainly more resources can go towards that. I will say on you know sort of an optimistic note, when we started talking about this in 2018, 2019, we didn't get a lot of bites from the Hill or anywhere else really. There has been an increased uh, focus on the fact that we are not performing particularly well in Latin America, in Africa in the last two or three years. So that's a step in the right direction. I mean, you got to start with people actually caring and understanding that there's an issue there. But I think the initiative Min mentioned, which I wasn't actually aware of, is, is great. And I think that's what we should be doing. I mean, we have 40 million Spanish speakers in the U.S., 
a lot of them are very good content creators. Like, let's get that content distributed uh, to content starved networks and places where their only alternative has been, in some cases, to get Chinese and Russian content. So you don't necessarily need the US government to spend $100 million to set up this massive global media apparatus in Africa or in Latin America. You just need to be, I think, a little bit more strategic about distributing content well, um, you know, because the game is not just about content creation, which you have to be good at. It's about dissemination as well uh, and distribution. So I, I would love if that would really be the focus of the U.S. government, because, again, we have an amazingly creative independent media sector. We have great content creators in Hollywood. And we have a lot of Spanish speakers here. So like, let's use the private sector and just work to distribute that content in places where it's needed. Reed, I don't know if you have any, have any further reflections on sort of how in your organizations, you can be, you could ex expand your reach. I mean, in some of the new innovative ways you've talked about, I think get at that. Um, but, you know, we are working from behind here in a way, uh, which is not the fault, I think, of either of your organizations. It's just sort of the reality that we've, we've lost sight of the fact that these regimes sort of double down on this particular sort of asymmetric tool of, of gaining influence around the world. And now we're catching up, as you just said. Um, so from, from your perspectives, what more can we do to sort of close the gap? Uh, yeah, I, I cannot agree more with what Brett just said. Uh, we spend a lot of money. It, it's not even, I don't even think it's a money issue. Like, of course, China pours uh, uh, what I think the number was like 60 billion or something for uh, uh, propaganda. Uh, but it is the dissemination. Is the, it, it is how you deliver the content to whom. Uh, you can have the best content in the world, but no one knows. So there has got to be a strategy. There's got to be, uh, uh, you know, people going into these markets to market the content itself and understanding each market's uh, situation and know uh, how we can up our game. Just for example, like uh, in, in Global South, say, like, like, just say like in Thailand, there are many uh, Mandarin uh, media outlets there because there are a lot of uh, Chinese speaking people living in Thailand and there is uh, uh, English uh, media in Thai and there's Thai media in Thai. And a lot of them, when it comes to China, reporting on China, they rely on Xinhua and CCTV. So a lot of them won't be able to afford uh, uh, subscribing to AP, Reuters, or AFP. So how do we get resources and help to them? Uh, you know, whether they take it or not, I think it should be available to these local media to help the quality of uh, their reporting and help us to get into the game. I do not think CCP uh, has any silver bullet in doing this. They just discovered this much earlier and started much earlier. And we uh, now are catching up. And I, I think uh, this uh, new effort, uh, you know, like repackaging, curating, and uh, finding a way to get more partners. Uh, I also like what Brett just said. We need uh, more partners uh, in the global media landscape to uh, work together, not just dumping our narrative there, but as journalists to journalists, these are the fact-based information that we all want to publish, we all want to share. Uh, and, you know, um, I think that that's, that's uh, what I thought, uh, you know, going forward, one of the recommendations that we can give to the Hill, to whoever uh, that can give resources to do this type of work. Yeah, if I can just pipe in a little bit there. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think obviously everything is going to be a little bit of a, a resource issue. And as someone in an organization, I mean, more resources are always welcome because you never really feels like you ever have enough to to, to work with. Um, but I mean, I think there's also a bit of, um, you know, just speaking as a, as a correspondent, as a journalist, someone who's reporting, you know, it's a bit of, you know, I, I think that this maybe applies to all of journalism, 
right now where we've been the last couple of years is finding new ways to tell stories, to deliver the information, going where the audiences actually are. And I think a lot of those trends are even, you know, amplified even more when we start looking at the global South where people are consuming most of their things on their phone. They're, you know, that's happening in the US, that's happening across Europe as well. But I think especially in lots of other parts of the world, it's it's phone only, you know, it's short form video, things like that. You know, it's tough to deliver information in that way. But also I think that there needs to be a bit of a mindset change and, you know, recognition that, you know, like I become from a magazine background, you know, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to do this 4,000 word investigation, this detailed thing. Um, but most people aren't going to read something that way, you know, finding ways to, yeah, you still need to do those things, but how to deliver it, how to chop it up, you know, how to present, take those same ingredients and present them in a very different way, um, I think is a big, a big part of it. And I think that maybe involves bringing in, uh a new outlook bringing in some and some resources to kind of shake things up in a bit because i think that you know there can be a tendency i think i'm not shocking anyone when you say in any kind of any kind of large organization public organization right you can get into we this is a way that we've been doing things but you can never be doing things the way you've been doing them. you always need to be innovating and pushing it and that's a very hard thing to maintain and i think even more so in a in a public kind of organization well, thank you both for sharing those thoughts. I think we're going to turn now to the audience Q&A as we were about at the 15 minute mark. So we have a question from VOA to all participants. Are there similarities between Russian propaganda regarding Ukraine before Russia launched a full scale, scale war and trends in Chinese propaganda before and after the elections in Taiwan? Uh, and then a broader question, can we say that certain signs and propaganda can serve as clear signs that a country is preparing a military action? Oof. That's a, yeah, that's a, a heavier one. Who would like to address either of those those two questions? At least the change in tactics, we probably... Well, I, I'll actually try to start with the last right. one, which if you look at Russia's information strategy before the full-scale invasion... Um, I think that probably is not what we'll see again. So it's maybe not a great sort of lesson learned um, kind of uh, <laughs> training ground there because Russia's approach before the invasion was to say that even the thought of an invasion was just absurd and Western propaganda and it wasn't going to happen. And that was actually very, very damaging for Russian credibility in the first six months of the war because you had all of these people who worked at these outlets around the world who I think genuinely believed this message and were putting their own credibility on the line, putting out memes that were sort of mocking the US of being these you know sort of crazy propagandists. And then like, whoops, you got tanks rolling in and you had a lot of people quit because they, they just couldn't square what they'd been saying with what the reality was. So I don't think we will see Beijing adopt that if there is an invasion of Taiwan, which obviously we hope there isn't. So I'm not sure that there's going to be a lesson learned there. If there is, it would be a, an odd strategy to try to replicate. The first part of the question, um, I, I don't know if I could necessarily say that there those we saw similarities between the sort of post-election in Taiwan and the post-full-scale invasion, uh, or I guess before was the question. So um, yeah, I, I don't know. I would maybe kick that to my colleagues. I mean, clearly we saw Russian disinformation tactics trying to dehumanize Ukrainians and establish them as, as the radicals and extremists. I don't know if we've seen the same thing with Taiwanese, maybe to a degree with some political figures, but uh, you know, Min would probably be far yeah. better positioned to answer that question. Yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, before the election, uh, as we just discussed a, a, a couple of years ago, the wolf warrior style was uh, very popular. Uh, they they go uh, head on, they go really strong. Um, but during the Taiwan election, they did try uh, to uh, mock certain uh, candidates, their background, like uh, taking briberies, uh, you know, having having uh, uh, extra extra marital child, you know, things like that. Um, but I I want to quickly point out a bright spot in this uh, uh, very uh, 
uh, in this discussion is I don't think Russia and China are always successful. I mean, just look at how much resources that China pour into uh, manipulating Taiwan's election. Uh, it didn't shift the, the results. So I, I just want to provide that so we we can have some hope in uh, the, the general uh, public audience. Uh, they have also learned uh, to be more sophisticated in this. Not everybody, uh, but uh, there is hope. <laughs> so, yeah, Reed, you have a two finger there? Um, maybe I'll pass on. I was going to say, maybe uh, I think that Min kind of said everything I was going to say. So. Got it. Uh, here's an interesting question. So the Kremlin has frequently utilized a decentralized approach to influence information operations, including outsourcing to local actors or proxies, and in effect, franchising, as the uh, the audience member says, uh, franchising these operations out. Could the CCP follow a similar approach, or will it remain centralized in state media and spokespeople? Um, I, I can hop in there. Um, you know, I it, it, obviously I don't have a crystal ball. I, I'm not sure exactly what's going on in those rooms, but I mean, from everything um, that I have ever seen or heard, um, it's a extraordinarily centralized model. How a lot of these, you know, the outlets will work um, in practice. You know, especially like a place like I'm thinking of. You know, my experience, a bureau on the ground in Central Asia, for instance. Right. Um, you have your top level managers, they're always going to be Chinese. I mean, there's still a bit of a distrust from local staff um, that exists a little bit, um, and especially in terms of holding management roles. So um, my first response would be, I, I think that would actually be quite difficult to replicate. I mean, I think that you are seeing the Chinese starting to, things are going to change, but I think that's, that's a hard thing. You know, I think that's the biggest struggle it's been for China in a lot of ways as it's really stepped out globally with a lot of this stuff is, you know, taking what it knows, what works at home, which is quite effective, but obviously you have this very walled off, tightly controlled environment. But when you're out in, in the wild, it's a very different sort of thing and you can't rely on those same mechanisms. Um, but I'd be curious to hear what everyone else thinks. No, I, I I agree what with what Reed just said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think even when you look at the the staff who have been hired locally by the Kremlin uh, or Kremlin state back media and Chinese state back media, it's going to be very different kinds of people. Um, you know, the the PRC tends to hire sort of very professional, um, you know, run of the mill kind of journalistic style, where the Kremlin's has a little bit more appeal to kind of younger, um, more digitally savvy. And there's a, just a sort of different tone to even the presentation. So you get this sort of New York Post style uh, reporting from uh, Russian state media, which you don't really see all that much in Chinese state media. I mean, a little bit in global time sometimes, but even that is it's different. So I, I would agree. I would think it'd be unlikely that we see uh, PRC state media go the Kremlin route and just kind of hiring young people who have a certain mindset and worldview and letting them run wild. I don't think that's going to fit with their uh, modus operandi. Great. Here's a, a good provocative question, uh, given that we're in a major election year, and it's a, it's a question that we do a lot of thinking about here at, at GMF. In the election context, are Russian and Chinese objectives shifting to long-term goals of eroding democratic discourse and democracy rather than seeking to influence a particular outcome of an election? Um, hence, recent unsuccessful election interference might be because their aims have shifted. You want to start with that, Brett, since we think about this a lot, and then we'll turn it over to, to Min and Reid. I mean, I, you know, I do think most of the time... Russia or China interfere in election, they do have a preferred candidate, preferred outcome. I think it's sometimes unfortunate that we have covered it as just their only goal is to sow mistrust. I think that is a secondary effect and they're very happy in some cases if that's the only outcome. So if you look at the US election coming up, I mean, I think it, it's not a stretch to say the Kremlin has a preferred candidate for obvious reasons. If they don't get their guy to win, I think if you end up with half of the country mistrusting the results, if you have a more polarized electorate, that's a win too. So there are side advantages. But uh, you know, I think if they're going to spend the resources to try to interfere in an election, 
I don't think their only goal is to try to undermine democracy. And again, I think there's different goals from China and, and Russia. Russia is fine with chaos. I don't think in, in many parts of the world, China would see that as being advantageous. Min or Reed, any, anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I, I, I am not sure, uh, you know, on this from uh, the CCP, uh, you, you know, like they, of course, has its own agenda, um, but I don't, I, I don't see uh, how uh, they would be overtly uh, trying to influence our uh, uh, election here. Um, and the other point I want to make is, um, uh, that I think, uh, you know, for what we do, uh, this, this is the time that, uh, uh, for us to cater to the Chinese domestic audience, to let them know what's really going on, uh, in the United States uh, that as our sister organization VOA does too. And that part of their job, I think it's very important, uh, in countering, uh, whatever disinformation they would put out there. Cause mostly I think that CCP want to demonstrate the chaos in the U S election campaign, the chaos in American style, uh, democracy. Th this is what, uh, they mainly wants to sell and, and our job will be, uh, covering, uh, what's really going on, uh, you know, in, in the U S and also carrying the Chinese, uh, you know, for RFA carrying the Chinese response out to uh, the Chinese people and and to the uh, Western uh, world uh, that, you know, the, how they are responding to this. And also, I think um, I think the uh, Congress really understands the importance of uh, having media outlets like us and Radio for Europe uh, to keep its independence in covering these issues. And uh, that, you know, that is critical to the credibility of how we are uh, covering the, this U.S. election that's so important uh, uh, to many, many countries. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, in my personal opinion, I mean, I think this, the scariest types of disinformation are always the ones that have domestic origins um, and I think are probably the more most harmful. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously, as everyone said, I mean, the Russians are a lot more comfortable with sowing the seeds of chaos or turning on the the fire, ho fire hose of falsehoods, as people like to say. Um, you know, I think a thing also that always sticks out to me when looking at on the China side of things is, you know, there is, yes, there is the very outward, the one engaging with the world, that kind of messaging, but there's also a lot of reporting what's happening in the country just to send it back home, which I think more in the context of American elections, I mean, I think it's showing, look at this messy, ugly process of democracy. Aren't you glad that we have, you know, stability? And I think that that message is then getting sent to other parts of the world that are also more authoritarian and have governments that are very okay with China, then broadcasting that message as well to their own people. Um, you know, I think of just a very like basic example. I, I remember once years ago, I was a freelance journalist and I wrote this thing for the Washington Post, though, looking at the legacy of House of Cards as a TV show. Um, and, you know, that's like a famous thing. You know, it shows this really grimy, gross look at what American politics and democracy really are. And, you know, Iran, let it air on TV for everybody to watch just because I thought it was just so damaging. Look at what America's really like. You know, it was one of the most downloaded and watched shows in China in its second season. All these things, you know, it was huge in Russia at the time, you know. So I think there's there's always this this other side of the of the blade here when we're talking about this in terms of, you know, yes, it's interfering of things abroad, but also then taking that and sending that message back home to their own people. I think is a really big part of the equation. Well, we have, we have so many more interesting questions that are coming in. It's such a thought-provoking conversation, but we are about to hit time. Um, the sad news is this is a very evergreen topic. So there's there's we can go on for hours talking about all of this. Um, so hopefully we have another opportunity to continue this conversation. Um, with all the elections coming up this year, clearly there will be a lot more discussion of this nexus of Chinese and Russian state-sponsored uh, information manipulation and disinformation. Uh, Min, Reed, 
Brett, thank you very much for sharing your insights. Uh, please do, everyone in the audience, continue to, to support Radio Free Asia, Radio Free Europe. Uh, check out our tools here at the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Funds. We are covering these issues every day. Thank you for your attention, for your participation, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.